So one thing about what I wanted to present about, I was looking at the different options and found the assignment of I want to learn more. I want to be able to have better study skills. And as I was thinking about that, I thought it would be a good thing for me to do. During the last winter semester, I took a Christ and Everlasting Gospel class. And my professor focused a lot on exegesis, doing an in-depth study of what the scriptures meant that day. I learned a lot from that class, but I've been really out of practice of thinking like that, so I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to review those skills. While I was doing my way through the Book of Mormon for class, I came across 1 Nephi 22. I thought this chapter would be perfect because it's short, concise, clear, and full of doctrine. So, as I was going through that, I just had some assumptions. For me, in a chapter of Isaiah, I felt like it was really clear, portrayed doctrine in a way that was easy to understand. And just thought it showed a good relationship that we have with God and Christ. So I used different study methods, and the way I took it is I because the chapter was short, I was able to read the chapter each time, looking at a different viewpoint, and doing different study methods. So the first time, I just did a clean read-through, and the next, I looked through the cross-references, going over it again, I looked through the 1830 edition, and made comparisons, and looked through Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible, and then look at the website scriptures.byu.edu. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to use some of the references that I found to be really helpful, and not really focus on some of the things that were obvious or were already known. So my first reading of this, I thought something that was very interesting is that it uses the name Jehovah. I served a mission in New York City at the center of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And that was something that I heard a lot about, how Jehovah was taken out of the Bible. So I thought, why in this instance was it kept in? Doing some research, I found that when the translators translated it, they left it in in four different instances. Most of the time, this is what you will see. In the Hebrew is the letters YHWH. Y -H -W -H. This is because in Hebrew there they do not write the vowels, and so this was our Yahweh, and in Greek, or how we pronounce it, Jehovah. The four times that is used in the King James Bible is Exodus 6, Psalms 18:18, 18, 18, Isaiah 12, and Isaiah 24, 6. In Exodus 6 3, this is when the Lord is speaking to Moses. It says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. My name Jehovah was I not known to them. Reading through and wondering why they left it as Jehovah in these instances, I found that when I heard it was specifically referring to the name of God, it used the Jehovah, and when it was just in the ways of a title, it was used as Lord. And this is our case in 12.6. We're in, sorry, 2 Nephi 22.2. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. After this, I went through and made comparisons with Isaiah 12. 2 Nephi 22 is when that Nephi, or Jacob, is quoting these chapters from Isaiah. Overall, there was not very many differences. The large majority were in tenses of verbs, or the biggest one was in punctuation. And thinking about it, I was wondering what all these punctuation changes mean, or if there is significance to them. I'm not an English expert, and so I had to do a lot of reading on this. And the biggest difference I found was the difference between a colon and a semicolon. A lot of the times in the Isaiah, it was a colon. A lot of times in 2 Nephi, it was a semicolon. From what I gathered, a colon is used when it's two clauses of unequal weight, where a semicolon is used for 
two clauses of equal weight. So one of the examples of this was in verse 6. Cry on the shout, thou inhabitants of Zion. Semicolon, or colon, in Isaiah. For great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. And looking at this, we can see how these small differences can make in the ways we interpret these. And this is where I, th I think it's got really interesting for me was in the 1830 edition. Um, there was a thousand copies that looked like this printed. And I learned a lot by going through of how the manuscript was set and printed. Um, one thing that I noticed, Jehovah was still capitalized. Like, who made that decision? Looking through more, I found that in the manuscript, it was not capitalized, and it was the printer John H. Gilbert, who made that decision, so it lined up with what was printed in the Bible, common in that day. Going through and look, researching more about him, I found a very interesting article written by him, and a very interesting account from him about the printing of the Book of Mormon, that also highlighted another question I had while going through the 1830 edition. Because some of the differences in grammar went back to the Bible edition in the 1830 edition, so the Isaiah in the 1830 edition seemed to line up. I was wondering why that was. This account shed a little bit of light on that. So, he said, when the printer was ready to commence work, Martin Harris was notified, and Hiram Smith brought forth the installment of the manuscript. Of 24 pages, closely written on common full scrap paper. He had it under his vest, and vest coat closely buttoned over it. At night, Hiram Smith came and got the manuscript, and with the same precaution, carried it away. The next morning, with the same watchfulness, he brought it again, and at night took it away. This was kept up for several days. The title page was set up. After proof was read and corrected, several copies were printed for Harris and his friends. On the second day, Martin Harris and Hiram Smith began being in the office. I called their attention to a gra grammatical error, and asked whether I should correct it. Martin Harris consulted with Hiram Smith a short time and turned to me and said, the Old Testament is ungrammatical, set it as it is written. After working a few days, I said to Hiram Smith, on his handling me the manuscript in the morning, Mr. Hiram Smith, if you would leave this manuscript with me, I would take it home with me at night and read it and punctuate it. And I could get it along faster in the daytime. For now, I frequently just stop and read half a page to find out how to punctuate it. His reply was, we are commanded not to leave it. A few mornings after this, when Hiram Smith handed me the manuscript, he said to me, If you will give your word, this manuscript shall be returned to us when you get through with it, I will leave it with you. I assured Smith that though it, that it should be returned, all right when I got through with it. For two or three nights I took it home with me and read it and punctuated it with a lead pencil. This will account for the punctuation marks in pencil, which is referred to in the Moore Report, an extract from which will be found below. Martin Harris, Hiram Smith, and Oliver Cowdery were very very frequent fr visitors to the office during the printing of the Mormon Bible, Book of Mormon. The manuscript was supposed to be the handwriting of Oliver, Oliver Cowdery. Every chapter, I remember correctly, was one solid paragraph without a punctuation mark from beginning to end. So we, found, we find that the punctuation for much of the Book of Mormon was done by the printer. And so this can account for some of the changes that we've seen as punctuation has been modernized and standardized in the past 200 years. Next, went to Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, and this is something that I found a lot with in my New Testament class, was looking at the original Greek or Hebrew. And so I've had a lot of experience with this and always enjoy going to it. This is where I found a lot of the stuff about Jehovah, Yahweh, but picking up some more highlights from it. In verse two, trust. Um, the Hebrew word for trust can also is batak, and it's talking about to be confident. It's like, I will trust in the Lord. I will have confidence in him. And then next was salvation, Yahshua. And this can mean welfare, which is a great way to think about how if the Lord is our fit salvation, how much that really means, how much we really need his help. And then in verse 5, it uses the phrase, excellent things, which I thought was a very peculiar phrasing going 
through Strong's that is Geuth. And it means majesty. My last thing of study was from scriptures.byu.edu. This is a site I've heard a lot about, but have not really gotten the chance to use extensively. While there wasn't much for this chapter of Isaiah 20, or 2 Nephi 22, I did find that this was very interesting. This was a, a talk by Elder Orson Pratt, Pratt given in the 1987 March Conference to all the saints. This is him talking about Zion. We read, I mention all these things in order that the Latter-day Saints may be re-refreshed and regret the great events that must take place in the latter times, and that strangers who are in our midst may have a more full understanding of the views of the Latter-day Saints in regard to the ancient prophecies. You see, we are looking for the building up of Zion on the earth, for the lifting up of the standard of the Lord, and ensign for the nations. Or in other words, as I read the commencement of my remarks, for behold, Zion shall go forth and become the joy of the whole earth, and the glory of God shall be upon her. And the day shall come when the nations of the earth shall fear and tremble because of her, and shall fear because of her terrible ones. Why? And this is where our chapter of Isaiah, or Second Nephi, comes in. Because the Lord Himself will be in the midst of Zion before He comes on the Mount of Olives. Interesting to read how an apostle of the Lord talks about this chapter, how this shall be known to the world because.